And now, I have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished Class Day speaker, someone who knows exactly what it is like to translate a Columbia education to the real world. Katori Hall is an award-winning playwright, screenwriter, and member of the Columbia College graduating class of 2003. <laughs> Woo! Her academic and professional accolades began during her time as an undergraduate here, receiving top departmental honors at the time of graduation for her work through the Institute for Research in African American Studies. But her, but her accomplishments only start there. Ms. Hall is best known for her play The Mountaintop, which starred Samuel L. Jackson as Martin Luther King Jr. and won the Olivier Award for Best New Play in 2010. She is, she is also a Pulitzer Prize winner for her play The Hot Wing King, a two-time Tony Award nominee, and the current showrunner on the popular television series Pea Valley. Ms. Hall is a perfect example of someone who has utilized the work she accomplished at Columbia to create an incredibly successful career. Her first play, Hoodoo Love, was adapted from a prompt she responded to in a Columbia assignment, and she revised the play's content while working toward an MFA at Harvard. Hoodoo Love would go on to be selected for the Cherry Lane Theater Mentor Project, premiering off-Broadway in 2007. It is with great pleasure and sincere admiration that I now welcome Katori Hall to the podium. Thank you. Oh my goodness, nine o'clock, something like that. And y'all are roaring like the lions that you are. <laughs> so this is where the party at, huh? <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I, before I jump in, I have to give a slew of thanks. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, President Bollinger, Dean Surratt, um, Columbia faculty, administration, my dear parents, Cat May and LaSalle over there somewhere. <laughs> she waving. <laughs> Um, and my dear friend Marva, who have come here today to make a memory with me. But most importantly, the folks I have to thank are sitting right in front of me. It is the class of 2023. Congratulations. I thank you so profusely because I am grateful to be standing here today and making a memory with you, to breathe the same air with you, to be alive here with you. Now, 20 years ago, yes, 20, I sat where y'all sitting right now. I was part of a class that saw the towers crumble to the ground. I was part of that class that saw America wade into an unwinnable war. I was also part of a class that paved the way to the first black president. Yes. That good old class, a CCO3. I was also a part of a class that got their first Facebook accounts, <laughs> first cell phones. I had that Nokia. It wasn't a flip phone, though. It just was like brick. It was just there. Oh, and I also had a Blackberry. It wasn't a fruit. Now, class of 2023, you are part of a class that saw the world go dark in the spring of 2020 a worldwide pandemic plunging us into what felt like a never-ending intermission. You have suffered unimaginable loss of time and sometimes life. You are part of a class that has seen the rise of hatred sired by misinformation. But you are also a class that sits at the threshold of a digital revolution that no one has ever seen before. I mean, y'all got Twitter, y'all got Instagram, y'all got what the thing called, the ticket talketh. <laughs> I ain't got that one yet. <laughs> 
Yes, it is an indication that the more things change, the more things stay the same. You see, there will always be darkness and promise, tears of joy and tears of pain. You see, what y'all finna embark upon right now ain't no joke. It is mighty. He is unfair and she is unpredictable. They are all a little thing called life. Now over these past 20 years since I graduated, I have collected memories, scars, and wounds, some still open in my dance with life. But I have found that wounds can weep with wisdom. And today, I'd like to share a few of Auntie Tori's rules with you. Yes. See, that's what they call me on the ticket talker. They call me Auntie Tori, so I'll claim it. I'll embrace that name. There are too many to name, I will have to say. I, like my fictional child, Uncle Clifford of P Valley fame, have, yes, I got some Uncle Clifford fans in the house. Hey! I have an intricate penal code and playbook to life. These rules have helped me navigate the dark times and the glory. I will start with a rule hard learned in these Columbia halls. So Auntie Tory rule 25.22. Don't never come up missing in your own mirror. Your reflection demands to be seen. So last century, in the year of our Lord in 1999, I arrived to the gates of Columbia at Amsterdam in 116th. I remember tumbling out of a yellow cab held at LaGuardia with a trunk that was made out of more sawdust than wood. My athletic socks were high above my knees per the fashion of the city country folk back in the day. So those socks also made one of my best friends kind of look at me with the side eye. I don't think she wanted to be my friend because of them socks, but future Judge Marva Brown quickly forgave me of that faux pas because, quite frankly, I had other dragons of countryness to slay. You see, I spoke with a twang and a twerk on my tongue that made me self-conscious to speak. My Memphis dialect fused with African-American vernacular was tattooed to this tongue of mine. I will be the first to admit that it made me a little bit insecure to the point that I was too scared sometimes to even speak in class, even when my grade depended on it. Y'all know those classes. <laughs> it truly felt like I spoke a completely different language from my other Columbia brethren and sistren with all these ain'ts and finnas that peppered my speech. At that point, I must say, I wrongly believed the assumptions about Southerners, about black Southerners especially. I wrongly believed that I didn't belong here. It's this psychological weight of many a student who hail from a different land even when we're coming from the same world. Instead of speaking, I chose silence, opting to keep my opinions to myself. And what Columbia student can do that? And yet I did. And so for a very long time, almost my entire time, I struggled to share my voice. I hid it. I was ashamed of it. But that one assignment in that Columbia playwriting class led by Professor Austin Flint changed all that for me. Professor Flint, may he rest in power, was a tall man with a smile that made you feel what Richard Wright once wrote, the warmth of other suns. The assignment was two people fighting over an object and go. It was the very essence of conflict, you know, one of the very tenets great drama is built upon. In my head popped a brother and his blue singing sister fighting over a mojo bag in a shack around the corner from Blue Street, from Bill Street, my, my bad. I remember riding with a fury, 
It was if my tongue had been freed through my fingers. I suffered in silence no more as my loud black southern voice, mighty and true, came to life on the page. I got a chance to perform those pages for my classmates, in fact, and Professor Flint said what my heart had known all along. My God, what poetry. It was in that instance I embraced my voice. I embraced the words that only I could string together. You see, I didn't realize that the way I spoke was actually a form of resistance, a symbol of resilience. The fact that my very tongue had refused to forget the cadence and sounds of my ancestors was remarkable. No slave chains, no ocean, no Jim Crow, no white supremacy could erase the memory of Africa that danced upon my tongue. It was not a cause of shame but a celebration that I had refused to leave my ancestors behind. It was this deep commitment to my own authenticity that completely transformed my life personally and creatively. I vowed to always represent who I was, where I came from, from the page to the stage to the screen. In representing me, I was representing us, and in representing us, I was representing humanity. Amen. We got some believers in the house. Each and every one of you are unique. Nothing to be ashamed of here. Your own lived experiences, your dreams, your mistakes, all make up the unique puzzle of what makes you, you. It is to be celebrated and honored. Show up in that mirror. If not for yourself, then for all who have come before you and for all who are going to come after you. <laughs> now, I think about that young woman that I saw in that mirror long ago, that woman who was stepping into her light and her legacy. Hmm. You see, leaving behind a legacy ain't easy, child. In fact, it's one of the hardest things to do, but it's what you are here and what you were born to do. Which leads me to my next rule, Auntie Tory Rule 35.77. Sometimes you got to water a tree with your own spit. I'm going to say that again. Sometimes you got to water a tree with your own spit. Now, there are going to be times when you don't have all you need, all you deserve to achieve your master plan. So what are you going to do? You're not just going to stand there, are you? complain, turn, or walk away? No, you're gonna write yourself into history, just like me. Before I even wanted to be a dramatist, I had to take acting classes because I had to the acting, uh, I had caught the acting bug, y'all. And I remember taking this class at our sister uh, college, Barnard College. Yes. And our teacher, Professor Becky Guy assigned a really, really, really great thing. She said, go to the library and find a play that has a scene for you and your scene partner's type. Now, my scene partner happened to be the Kelly McCreary, who would go on to uh, do a nine season arc on Grey's Anatomy BC03. <laughs> yes, we were two young black women who wanted to achieve our dreams and to represent our community, ourselves, in the dramatic arts. So I remember me and Kelly going on down to Butler Library right here. We pulled play after play after play after play off of the shelf, and we couldn't find one play that had a scene for two young black women. So we went back to Professor Guy. Now I know you know, I know you have a suggestion. You've been teaching for so long, you must know of a play that has a scene for two young black women. 10 seconds went by, 20 seconds went by, 30 seconds went by, and then 
40 seconds went by, and Professor Guy could not think of a play for us. It was in that moment I decided I was going to write those plays then. I was going to be the one who filled those shelves, if not for myself, then for the other Kellys who deserved a world where she had as many opportunities as her white colleagues to practice her craft and grow by leaps and bounds. Class of 2023, you see, sometimes an opportunity presents itself in the dark and this is when you don't take no for an answer. You stand up to the emptiness, whether it is a shelf that needs to be filled, a cure that needs to be found, or a new president that needs to be elected. You do the work that only you can do. Lions don't take no for an answer. In fact, I heard they roar. <laughs> But you might say, Auntie Tori, what if I fail? What if I see the tree and I water it with my blood, my sweat, even my tears? And what if it doesn't grow? What about that, Auntie Tori? Well, I got a rule for that too. 100.23, failure ain't fallen as long as you enjoy the flight. I'm going to be the first to tell you, you are going to fail. You are going to fail at something. One day you may fail at everything. It's part of the journey. It could be a relationship, a business enterprise, a play you write closes before it even opens. Yes, you are going to fail, but don't run away from it. Most people mix their goals with expectations instead of enjoying each and every moment of the gift of trying, the gift of the attempt. There are so many plays of mine that are in the drawer. There are so many plays of mine that are not box office smashes. There are so many plays of mine that haven't seen the light of day. Failure is one of the key ingredients to success. It opens the door to a fire called grit. Oftentimes your dance with failure leads you through the threshold of success. I don't even call it failure anymore. It's a blessing cloaked in a lesson. Preparation for the day that the yes will inevitably come. Which leads me to my next rule. Number 227. All you need is one yes. You just better know what you're going to do with it when you get it. Now, there's a play of mine that has been my biggest failure and my greatest success. It's a little play called Pussy Valley. Now, I feel bad for saying that my mama going to get me, but yes, that's the name of the play. Now, Mixed Blood Theater was the only theater in the entire nation that stepped up to produce this play. I mean, I had the time of my life putting on this play. But when I saw it, I was hit with a huge realization. Oh, hell, this ain't a play. This a TV show. It was a three-hour-long extravaganza that actually should have been 10 hours long. But luckily, 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 I did not look at it as a failure. In fact, I looked at it as an opportunity. An opportunity to see what this story truly wanted to be. Now, when I went out to Hollywood to pitch my play into a TV show, I pitched every network I could, but some wouldn't even let me through the dough. I pitched and I pitched and I pitched, and I got no after no after no after no after no. But then I got the opportunity to pitch in front of a Latinx executive named Marta Fernandez, who convinced her thin boss president of stars, Chris Albrecht, to hear me out. It was the day I walked out with my one yes. <laughs> but now the next five years were tumultuous. Baby number one turned into baby number two. I had this deadline to make, that deadline to make. I was developing and developing this play. And yet, it seems so far away. My yes began to crumble before my very eyes as the company was swallowed up in a merger and my biggest champions left the network. It was then 
that I had the toughest day of my life as a showrunner. Another executive on their way out of the door flew down to Atlanta to tell me that the new powers that be were considering canceling the show. We weren't even halfway finished shooting and they were already having conversations to scrap my little baby. And it was all unbeknownst to me. It was gonna be the end of P-Valley before it even began. Now I did what any showrunner would do. I snatched my phone, I walked to my car, I slammed the door, and I cried. Yes, I cried, I cried, I cried, I cried, I cried. My one yes was slipping through my fingertips. It was a bad day in the valley, child. But there truly was a chance that people weren't going to see the story I had been working on for 10 years long. And this is when I come to my last rule. Rule number one. What God got for you, she got. I came to work every day as if I had not heard of the plans to scrap my show, and I focused on what I could control. I poured my heart into every character, every moment, every choice, not because someone was going to see it, but because storytelling was my passion and not just a job. If it was going to be a failure, it was going to be the most fabulous failure no one ever saw. It was the first and last day I ever cried on the job because black girl joy was going to be my revenge. The new powers that be, they withheld the ax and somehow allowed us to finish filming. But my last day at work was bittersweet as I did not know if an audience would ever meet the family that I had been spending 10 years of my life building. But I had faith that there was a greater power than the powers that be. For me, God had it, and it was done. I had stood in my authenticity and shown up in my own mirror. I had nourished my tree daily with blood, sweat, and sometimes tears. I had danced with my lover failure multiple times, and at the end of that long and winding road, P-Valley premiered and became one of the most successful series in the network's history. As my patron saint Beyonce once said, always stay gracious, best revenge is your paper. <laughs> now that story, and quite frankly, the story of me is a true testament that faith, both spiritual and communal, can manifest a yes in a world of no. Class of 2023, you are walking into a world of no. You are walking into a world that throws its hands up at climate change, at gun control. You are walking into a world where lies are being peddled as facts, dismantling the very bedrock of logic your very education is based upon. A war is being waged on women's bodies in the wake of the fall of Roe versus Wade. Attacks on our queer family are on the rise. Workers worldwide continue to struggle against a system that values price over people. Even today, I stand in solidarity with my fellow writers of the WGA, striking, yes, WGA power, striking to demand better wages and limits on artificial intelligence that threatens to replace not only us, but other workers in other vulnerable industries. But I stand before you today, my lions. You cannot be replaced. Your unique experiences, your mistakes, your dreams, your solutions are what we need in this world oh so badly today. We need you to stand in your authenticity, stare failure in the face with no fear, because you all have withstood a darkness that nobody has ever gone through before. You, class of 2023, are truly, truly the resilient ones. May your wounds give you wisdom and may your failures give you grit. May your faith withstand the test of time and may you step into your future with pride tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Demand today 
that this world of no welcome you into your tomorrow of hell, yes. Thank you.